and welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 447, recording today live on Wednesday, the 11th of May, 2016. Uh, welcome to our YouTube live streaming audience and also our uh, old school audience. Well, I say old school, our original audience where we stream live also to sonicstate.com forward slash live. We're streaming to two places because we want to see as many people as possible to see the stream because we have a lot of fun doing this podcast, which is the music technology and social comment, all of that kind of stuff. Anything to do with creating music music or performing music uh, in the studio with synthesizers with software all of those sort of things so if you want to stick around and see what we're talking about today please do if this is your first time and if it's your first time again please do subscribe you can subscribe on youtube you can also subscribe on itunes and all the usual places anyway thank you very much for joining us also want to say thank you to our sponsors isotope uh, we will be running a competition later uh, to win a copy of ozone 7 the uh, brilliant mastering and audio processing suite of plugins and in fact we ran a competition last week so if you stick around you might have won if you entered and if you haven't enter this week anyway let's get straight on with it so uh we'll start over here we'll say hello to mr richard hilton rich hilton of course uh chic keyboard player about to head off into the world for a numerous gigs touring with duran duran all around america all over the world frankly and also works in the studio with Nile rogers how are you rich very well, thank you. I am glad beautiful, to hear that. Beautiful day today. Yeah, it's nice. It, it is actually nice. To, it was weird. This week, last Sunday, it was like they switched the switch to turn summer on. We haven't had a transition. It just went ping. And then since then, it's been raining the entire time in the UK. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a, normal. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of a shame. Anyway, great to have you, Rich. Uh, I guess, um, have you been, are you in prep for shows? Or although you're pretty much sorted out for that, you just got a kind of other stuff to get on with? Well, we are in prep for some of the shows that we're doing because some of them are festival shows where we have guest artists whom we'll be backing. So um, there are preparations being made for that stuff, and there's other recording projects being engaged. And uh, I'm basically home for about the next month to five weeks for the most part, and then we move on to... uh, First some stuff in Europe, and then we resume Duran Duran in the U.S. Right. That's going to be great fun. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your progress, although I guess we probably won't see much of you during that time. Um, But, you know, that's just the way. You never know. Never know. I always try. Yeah, it's always good fun. Which See if we can guess which hotel chain you're in based on the background. (laughs) 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 Well, we shall see. It's tricky because they're all merging now. Yeah, maybe we can make that part of the Sonic Talk drinking bingo game. So, uh, yeah, Rich is in... uh, x or y anyway thank you for joining us and also we've got mr mark tinley who's there in uh, with sporting new hair much less of it i'd say i have to say mark this is probably your most pedestrian hairstyle for some time but uh, <laughs> uh, pleased to see you nonetheless how have you been i'm all right yes very good now I'm opening it i'm opening a shop yeah that's why you're opening a shop please do explain this because this is an unusual step well it seems. Um, I don't know that it is actually. I mean, I I was I was um, kind of pottering around the house, and I was musing to myself that I had enough musical gear to open a shop, and then I just uh, had this little revelation: like, why don't I do that? Oh yeah, okay, I'm opening a shop. So I uh, there was a shop in a place called Abbey Muse in Glastonbury, which came up for rent. Uh, so when I had a chat with the guy. And now I've got less musical stuff in my house and some of it in a shop. And um, I've bought lots of shop fittings. That was expensive. And insurance and cash registers and display cabinets. <laughs> are you, what are you selling then? And now you I'm sell- going like, what? Oh, well, that's the next step, isn't it? Now I've got to work out what I'm actually <laughs> going to sell. <laughs> so um, what am I selling? I guess I'm selling my, um, my unique... Um, take on music so i i'm not going to try and compete with any of the big guys like absolute music or or i guess in america it's sam ash or guitar center or whatever because they can buy in such huge bulk that i could never get anywhere close to their prices um so i'm i'm going in the sound art direction and okay. i'm making more things like the gas can guitar i made a guitar out of a or a sort of a one string diddly bow thing out of a, a dat box the other day and actually it was my wife's loofah which i found found lying around the house and i just kind of looked at it and i thought hmm that's a guitar neck and i was like do you mind if i have this and she said no no i use that and 
Too late. Snooze you lose. A few hours later, it had a, a piezo pickup and a, and a bridge and a nut and a, and, a, and a tuning peg on it and a whole load of other stuff. So you're so, going to be making kind of bespoke type of instruments. Is that the idea? And that's that sort of stuff. Is that your... I am going to be doing that. But also, there's a very clever guy in a workshop upstairs who knows how to program Arduino. And I got talking to him and I was explaining how I'd uh, made impulse responses of my gas can guitar and i've done it so that i can play a humbucker pickup through the impulse response and it sounds almost i mean close as damn it to the to the gas can guitar so i was saying wouldn't it be cool if you could put that in a pedal and he said oh yeah it's just dsp i mean well what do you mean could i said could you put an arduino in a pedal no no it's not fast enough i was like all right okay well, I mean, is it doable? Yeah, oh yeah, it's doable. It's just DSP. You use the Arduino to speak to the DSP. You need a chip number, blah, 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 and you just do this and that and the other. And I'm like going, hmm, hang on a minute. Wow. So, um, so it might be a, a sort of a playground for musical toys, and then maybe a a, a kind of a, a spawning ground for some Kickstarters as well. And then, may, so maybe I'll make a guitar pedal, you know, actually go into manufacturing. That might be fun. Wow, um, so a whole new phase. That does sound yeah. very interesting. So uh, lots, lots of things to deal with, but uh, that sounds exciting. Yeah. So um, what's the shop called and where is it? Come on, let's have a plug. When's it, and when's it open? It's called... It's, it's sort of open now if you want to come by and buy random things, but it's, it, it's, it's finding its direction. So the doors are open and I'm in there every day. Uh, it's called Sonus Magus, which is S-O-N-U-S, yep. like the Latin for sound. And M A G U S, like the Latin for magician or magic. Um, so it's sonusmagus dot com, um, and it's in ten Abbey Mews wow, in Glastonbury, okay. off, the, off about halfway up that well, nearer the top of the high street than the the bottom. You have to go into actually into a place called Abbey Mews, and I'm sort of in there in the brightly coloured one at the end. Um, and I'm sort of like taking things there every day and hanging things on the walls and sitting on the floor playing with circuit bent stuff, much to the amusement of the head hairdresser across the way who's probably in her mid sixties who <laughs> keeps coming out and going, What's that noise? Right. Well what's I What's that noise? More more Somerset, but what's that excellent. noise? Well, I, I hope to visit that at some point and best of luck with it, Mark. Right, uh, let's get on Thank to you. we also have Mr. Ty Unwin. One of the hardest Ooh. working men in composing, although every time we see him, obviously he's not working hard on composing because he's talking to us. But I assure you, it is the case. How are you, Ty? Uh, I'm fine. Although it was brought to my attention again. Someone in the chat room said, oh, what's it with the eye? Thinking I've got a black eye. It's just because I'm tired. <laughs> it's just because I've had no sleep. Oh, it's no. Just, so that's why the glasses have gone on. Not because I'm... You know, kind of, uh, we have very no, similar I'm, glasses. I've noticed. I've got a new pair. They're yeah. very similar yeah. indeed. It's, the, it's, yeah. it's all the, the rage. It's yes, exactly. Look at us trendsetters. <laughs> um, no, no, th things things are good, and just working. I'm doing a uh, load of work for the UK, BBC stuff, and then a load of stuff for uh, America, LA stuff, which means that I'm kind of working two days oh, basically. Yeah, night time. So changes. we all know that feeling. So um, yeah, I'm just getting no sleep at all, really. But that's fine. That's fine. It'll be over it's at fine. some point. <laughs> <laughs> friday friday the the uh the the la stuff is over on friday all right so friday yeah so the weekend i will just collapse basically but that's fine excellent i'm, well, used to it. I'm glad to hear it so that does that mean you've had no time to buy any new synthesizers this week i've bought do you know i've bought no new synthesizers i have actually looked at something which may come up later but that possibly might venture towards but no i haven't bought anything ah. and also i have to say in talk of preparation with Mark Shop and whatever, in terms of preparation of subject matter for today, I'm slightly in the. But I do apologise, but I'm, right. I'm quite happily going to wing it. We could. Uh, I, I made a purchase. It arrived this morning. Oh, did Dominion arrive? Fantastic. Yeah. So I. Are you a happy bunny? Well, I, I I've, I've set it up and I'm trying to see what it'll do uh, that the sub does. If there's mm -hmm. common ground, so it might replace it for the live set. But I'm immediately thinking, oh, I can't get right. I'm, so my next job is how do I fit all the stuff on the same table? Because I've actually got a gig. Uh, I did mention this. Let me see. On the 18th of June at the Chap Chapter Arts Centre in Cardiff, uh, where I will be one of the guests uh, performing um, at the Kimry Beats um, Cardiff Modular Meet. 
so uh, that's Fantastic. that's what i'm working towards anyway that that's enough of uh, my self promotion let's uh, let's get on to a topic uh, i think we had this one we did see this last week but we didn't see it in full this is a rotary magnetic bow a rotary magnetic bow is an electromechanical tool for extending is it is it not playing <laughs> oh that's a bit sad oh there it goes this is uh, an interesting it's an electromechanical doodah it's called coca's beat machine two let's see if we can fast forward it and find what it actually does it's a sort of an electromechanical box That you then mic up. In fact, I don't think this is actually in the video. I think it's the other video. It's the other video, the one that I haven't got. Well, that's not so good. Let me see if I can find it. (laughs) That's rather irritating. Uh, Well, no, it's actually a very interesting video. (laughs) It's not the one you were... Well, basically, basically he built this kind of little uh, little box which has got kind of solenoids and various things in it that, that... twang and hit springs and tap things that sounds actually really quite musical and you mic it up and amplify it and it's got some really kind of quite it it sounds amazing it's just a great little idea i mean i know it's probably not going to be a mass mass production perhaps at any time soon but uh, i enjoyed it a lot (laughs) help me out while i find the video rich well (laughs) well it reminds me vaguely actually since you mentioned it as a mechanically generated drum machine of something james taylor briefly toured with which was the size of one of those catapults they used to use in old in olden days for war. It was an enormous wooden structure that was a mechanical drum machine to which he performed at least one and maybe a couple of songs. And uh, this kind of reminds me of a miniature sort of uh, Vol- Volca version of that. Ah, well, I've actually found the video now, so maybe it'll work. Let's see. Cool. So this is... The yeah, kind of very springs and solenoids and things you drop. If I fast forward it a bit, it starts. I'll fast forward a bit. It sounds quite wacky on headphones um, because you're getting a lot of that bottom end from the uh, from the big spring. But it just, I just really like the idea. We covered something a little bit like this before, didn't we, with the ball bearing gravity machine, which was uh, yeah. which was just endlessly fascinating. I, I'd imagine took uh, this probably took a, a little bit less work because of the amount of uh, construction and engineering in it. But a really nice, uh, a nice idea. But who knows? Mark, <laughs> one, one for the shop. Perhaps exactly. This is the sort that of thing. That is exactly the kind of thing I want to be making in the shop. <laughs> Excellent. Well, maybe you need to get in touch with him and uh, see if you can get anything. Although, although actually, maybe not because it's acoustic, isn't it? And I'm I, I've set my uh, USP to be like everything that I do has to have an electronic element to it. Although it's driven by electronics, I suppose, and it's transduced. Um, yeah. yeah. So there are electronics in there. That's true. Oh wow. Well. How long do you think it takes to make something like that? I mean, I could take weeks too making long. it. Good yeah, <laughs> too long to make it affordable. But too fun. Long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it would be it's... really good fun. <laughs> well, it would. I think the well, idea it's is... Kind of, it's kind of like the musical box that sits on your wife's dresser and when she opens oh, it to get the... Uh-huh. Yeah, plays a nice, uh-huh. good tune. Yeah, that's I've an bought interesting... some musical boxes. I've bought some musical boxes. I'm in the middle of hacking them. Um, I, they play Happy Birthday <laughs> at the moment. Bending. I was trying to like change the pins around to get them to do something slightly different. Aren't they bizarre as well? You wind them around and they're like really, really quiet. And I was saying to my son last night when we were having tea, I was saying, listen to this. And then I put it on the kitchen table and wound it round, and it turned the whole of the surface of the kitchen yeah. table into a soundboard. And suddenly it's like really loud. And he's going, how did it do that? And I'm like, actually, I don't know, but it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, let, me, let me put a switch into the side of the thing so we can switch it in and out. Yeah, that'll be able to decouple it. <laughs> well, Ty, any room for something I like this in your, you know, there must be a project somewhere waiting waiting where you can go, I, I what I need, I need something like this. Oh, there's lots of things that I could say I need something like this. I don't think I need this. But, I mean, I, do, I love the idea of it. It's one of those that, 
you know, anyone that's got the amount of dedication that they're going to put into making something like this, you have to admire the fact that they're taking a different route. I think what I find balmy is the fact that it's essentially a, a, acoustic, almost trying to sound electronic. And so, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. There's a, obviously, it's very it's, it's acoustic. It has a very organic kind of feel, but it's also trying to sound electronic at the same time. And so there's just that bit of me going, you know, someone spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of love and attention making this thing that sounds, you know, it sounds, it sounds okay. It sounds, it sounds really interesting. And I absolutely admire the fact that he's made it. But with all of these kind of things, I just think the amount of time and love and attention that's gone into it. Um, well, maybe, yeah, maybe it's one of those things that he's got looking for other gigs or whatever. It does have the quality of a ruler over the end of the table at times, which is it does. also it, an enjoy. That... You can play that. Uh, you can also play that too, which is they can sound <laughs> great if you get the right material for the ruler. Absolutely. Pass the spoons, no, no. please. <laughs> Spoons, absolutely. Spoons, yeah. rulers, you know, they're all in there. But okay. making the would I would I take a lifetime well no, he's probably spent, you know, a good few months designing this and hats off to him. Fantastic. Yeah. But yeah. Good stuff. You know what I'm saying. Well, yeah. um I suppose um I did I, I, the next well anyway, you can check his stuff out. Uh he's called uh N- Coca Nicolazzi, and you can find him. It's called Coca's Beat Machine, and if you do a search online, um, you'll probably be able to see work because I'm presumably there are other iterations of it. Do check it out. Um, I did want to. I, I didn't want to start with this topic because it feels like it's becoming so sort of regular that we have to do a kind of not an obit piece, but you know, talking about an, yet another great musician who's left us. But the, uh, sadly, we have yet another one, and uh, and this guy is uh, pretty amazing. So I've got a little bit of video here. This is. Uh, part of Pulse the Planets by I say Tomita very groundbreaking electronic music artist uh, who passed away on May the 5th um, age 84 and it's you listen I listen to this stuff and I, I'm not that aware of a lot of his material but when I was listening to this, I was thinking, wow, this just sounds so much later in time than I expected it to. It's very... The, the mixing, the ambience, the... the I think this is actually a music box, perhaps, but uh, there's an awful lot that... Uh, a little bit later on, if I see if I can find it, because this is something that I know he pioneered quite, quite strong. Let me see if I can... I'm trying to find that. He did this sort of vocalisation of synthesizers, which is really quite remarkable. I'm just trying to find it. Here we go. And the, but there are a legion examples of things that he did first, and you know I, I don't confess to be a, a Tamita expert by any stretch, but I've been listening to it over the last few days, and it really has been surprising the sort of level of uh, innovation that was there. And I'm get I know because um, in the se- I think it was '74 where he first I think it was the first album which was the Debussy works, which was uh, Snowflakes of Dancing. I'm guessing Rich, you may well have been exposed to this because it was really big in the states, wasn't it? And it was very unusual for a a classical electronic works to do so well in billboard i think it topped the the uh, billboard charts in 74 at one point well it was leapfrogging on the backs of the great work by um walter slash wendy yeah. carlos uh that had preceded it and it was extraordinary when it appeared nobody uh in america had heard of isaiah tomita before this and his um very un um uh, unconstrained style of synthesis was really well suited to the Debussy music and the impressionistic nature of it. And I thought that record was, and I still think that record was brilliant and perhaps (laughs) I hate to say it, his crowning achievement, though I liked quite a bit about the rest of what he did. And he was always interesting and distinctive, even where he was jarringly unconventional. I mean, some of the themes, for example, you just played, from uh, the planets are very are rendered in a very very non traditional sort of textural way, and it's really cool and interesting to hear that he, he wasn't after some sort of grand imitative concept. He really wanted to push the synthesis aspects, and uh, you know he was wonderfully 
uh, creative and influential and recognizable and cool, even where uh, I wouldn't have preferred necessarily his versions over some others that other people had done. He was always brilliant. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I did notice listening to uh, both Snowflakes and this album is there are... uh, even though he's not going for the full emulative stuff, what he nailed, and he seemed to get more than anybody else up to that point, was the stereoscape and the ambience around certain sounds. So he got these amazing kind of cello and string sounds that were obviously synthesized, but sound so much more real because of the way that they were mixed and the way that it, they, they sounded. And his em- some of the emulations of the actual more traditional orchestral sounds were really impressive as well. I mean, that's something that... Uh, that's mm-hmm. when I was listening, I was thinking, wow, this is 1974. 75 is astonishing but it all had this sort of surreal quality to it even when it was somewhat imitative and um it he always brought a very cool personality to everything he did and uh was like i said distinctive and cool at all times wonderful wonderful musician and it's very sad that he's passed away Uh, i'm guessing ty um your you know, you do a lot of orchestration stuff. I mean, whether mm-hmm. it's uh, via traditional sort of contact libraries or string library or sample-based stuff. But uh, I'm guessing some of this must have had a resonance for you and an influence. I mean, I, I'm I'm guessing, obviously. Uh, it's a funny one actually because I never really got into to me to actually the first the first my first introduction to him was a really roundabout way because I'm <clears throat> I'm the kind of age where you know, can I really got into synthesizers very late seventies early 80s and um my first you know first time i found him was actually because of an mc202 because when you bought an mc202 you actually got a demo cassette with it and the demo cassette was actually the mc202's version of um snowflakes done in two parts uh-huh. and and it was you know and i, I loved it. i looked you know i was a classical pianist at that stage and so I, I knew you know debussy well and i went and found his stuff because of hearing that and and um he was credited on the demo thing i think and i went and and yet you're absolutely right the snowflakes and debussy is beautiful it's not it's not my bag because at the time i was more into jar you know jar right. and vangelis big time and i've always had a bit of an issue with uh taking classical music the whole wendy carlos thing is completely uh, does nothing for me I, I i don't get the take a classical piece of music and, and do it on synths, really. I, it's just something that's never rung true with me. Um, but you have to say, of all the people that have ever done it, he is kind of the best by a fairly long way, actually. And I've got a few of his, his later albums where he wasn't doing that and he was actually writing more original stuff. And that I appreciate a lot more because it's it's you know it turns me on. It's what works for me. But um, you're right about the, I mean, about the orchestration, about the synth sounds he got, you know, kind of, he was getting analog synths to do things that were incredibly, incredibly realistic, you know, kind of he, between him and, um, you know, kind of some of Vangelis's stuff that he was doing, you know, kind of with, with analog synthesis. It was, it was just incredible, the kind of realism, but you're absolutely right. A lot of that is down to the ambience and the, and the way it's written. You know, he was obviously very talented and very educated he, yeah he and did think, study orchestration i think that's where he kind of started out so absolutely and that that's what you know that's what shines through the other thing that i also i'm less keen on his work because of is for me personally um humor and lightness in music doesn't really kind of work for me i everything i tend to listen to and write and it's all quite heavy and big and <laughs> bombastic right. and you know it's, it's it's all dark and mysterious and although he does, you know, kind of the more mysterious quality, he's very good at doing um, the lighter, jollier, kind of make you smile kind of music. And I mean, the, his main lead sound, that kind of whistly sound from it's it 700S, it's a, a, one of the Korgs, I, I think, like. which is his main lead instrument. It's all very smiley, happy, and it's a beautiful sound, but, you know, it doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't go with your, your northern European sort of uh, ah, long winter nights. I should have been- I should have been Scandinavian or Icelandic, to be fair. So. <laughs> yeah, so. okay, fair enough. No, but, for, uh, impressive. But such a shame. Such yeah, a shame. absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose the only, one of the consoling factors is, you know, he was a ripe old age, and that, you know, is something. It wasn't a kind of, uh, you know, uh, it, he was... 
getting on and have done an awful lot of things so i suppose that's some consolation and also the fact that it seems to have been sort of quite sudden and not protracted and sort of sad and uh, you know he he was still working right up to the end which i think is is brilliant as well mark did did, did, did to me to have any uh, resonance with 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 you um, in your synthesis i'm guessing it might be not your cup of tea but i'm guessing um only in the same way as what's that Coriana Scatsy thing, that film that was oh, the Philip Glass did the thing. rounds and yeah. yeah. I mean in the same way that that touched me because people went, Oh, listen to this and you go and kind of watch that film and the same with this, people have said to me in the past, Oh, listen to this and having just listened to it again now um, I, I can't get my head around the fact that it's nineteen seventy four actually, because some of those sounds I associate with uh, digital synthesis so maybe i mm-hmm. yeah he used a lot uh, of ring mold, cause, didn't he? Cause, yeah yeah I, I mean i always associate kind of squelchy and and very thickly filtered and warm sounds with analog and then the more breathy light airy kind of stuff is always i i just made an assumption that none of those kind of sounds really came into being till after digital happened but i mean i know for now that the cs80 makes lots of those sounds and I'm sure loads of other synths at the time did, but it, um, you know, that kind of breathy, excited yeah. sound. So I was, ex- I was hearing big synth p- that pads with that kind of sound really surprised me. At the same time as reading like 1974. So um, yeah, it was very. I mean, have I, I think, missed something. No, no I, I haven't. Have I? It I is think, 1974. Yeah, it was. I think the other so thing. Was, the other thing that uh, sorry, the other thing that came out was the fact that. You know, he when he when he made Snowflakes of Dancing, I think he kind of bought a Moog three C derivative system. It was more custom than that, and just got totally right. uh, totally lost in it. And he said he he basically didn't sleep for kind of several weeks, and some of the stuff that he was doing it was like a hundred overdubs, and that's in the back. You know, it would have been twenty four tracks maximum, wow. and you know it would have been hard to access that stuff. I'm guessing he must have made some kind of living before that to be able to afford this technology but he obviously just totally but and he's still even now you know it's hard to find interviews with him uh, that are translated but you know there's things along the lines of you know he's still even you know until quite very recently he was still finding new ways of creating sounds using that synthesis technique and using the mode oh, really? and, yeah yeah that's that's dedication so um I mean, uh... What was I going to say? I've completely forgotten what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, the, the one thing, I mean, in the same way that Ty, Ty's not into it because it's not bombastic enough, I think that's what you said, MRM, I'm sort of paraphrasing. I'm not that's into fine. it because it, I, I, it sounds very Japanese and very regimented, and the Japanese have this way of uh, of looking at things and then copying them exactly and then recreating them and doing it all very exactly and and i like things to have like really gritty gnarly rough edges so my you know my favorite music i suppose is things like the new york dolls and they were all on drugs and falling over and tripping over their very (laughs) thickly ridiculous platform boots or whatever but there's something about that and iggy early iggy pop that really raw kind of all over the placeness that's where I, I like my music that I listen to to be. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little bit too clean and carefully worked out. And that's not to say that, I mean, I might get clean and carefully worked out sometimes, but I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. I, 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 but I, if you haven't listened to it, I mean, what it's very rich. I'm talking to speak generally our viewers is if you're not familiar with Tomita stuff it's worth just there's loads of it on YouTube you know the whole albums and those those albums in the 70s are well worth listening to it, it's sort of rich with the history of sound design and the way that electronic music has become constructed subsequently a lot of what he did was very pioneering and groundbreaking to to take electronic music from experimentalness into a much more uh, hi-fi stereo imagery you know ambience and that sort of thing it, it, it really is very impressive so uh, I, I think, think i think the thing the, the best best thing you can say about it is is really it's 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 stood the test of time really exactly exactly as mark said it doesn't really sound like 1974 oh. it could be it could kind of really be from any decade really you know there were there were parts of it that you know kind of yeah you kind of know that kind of resonant sweep is of that era, but you know you'll find something else straight afterwards that is is as current today as it was back in the mid seventies. You know, it, there is a lot. There's lots of electronic music from the seventies, as we well know, that hasn't aged well. 
and yeah. you know kind of this this isn't one of them this is but that is again that's down to the musicianship this that's down to the fact that he was he really knew what he was doing that's what it's down to yeah really well, like I say, do check his stuff out. It really is worth listening to, just in terms from a legacy point of view. And you may well discover something that you just, you know, can't live without. And I think that is great. But uh, yes, sad news um, uh, that that he's passed away. And I think his his work. I think he was working on something called Doctor uh, Doctor Capelius. I think it was called uh, Doctor Capelius. Yeah, that was uh, to do with. Uh, I think it was more of an orchestral piece. And I think he's got it to a point now where he's hoping it, he was hoping it could be finished by someone else if he didn't get round to it. So maybe we'll see the, the the last of his works coming along at some point in the future. Anyway, um, let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, now, this is the point where we get our competition, and it's the uh, word from our sponsors, who are, of course, Isotope. Isotope's Ozone 7 Plugins Mastering Suite. I'll let them take it over. Produce rich, full, professional-sounding tracks with the critically acclaimed mastering tools in Ozone and Ozone Advanced. Now, the latest Isotope innovations in Ozone 7 bring modern and vintage processing to the forefront of the music production experience. Updated for Ozone 7, Ozone's highly regarded maximizer features a brand new frequency-specific IRC4 algorithm that delivers transparent mixes with less pumping and distortion. Use it to smooth out an unwieldy mix or tame the kick drum peaks without affecting the vocals. The Dynamic EQ, now in both the advanced and standard versions of Ozone, lives and breathes with your audio, giving you more effective control over your sound without coloring your entire mix. Harness the precision of an equalizer and the musical ballistics of a compressor in one integrated processor. New for Ozone 7, vintage-inspired processing puts nostalgic tone at your fingertips to bring the creative color and character of analog hardware to your digital recordings. Glue your mix together and bring a natural feel to harsh-sounding recordings with the Vintage Limiter. Vintage Tape adds the dimension, warmth, and depth of tape saturation to your masters for a timeless sound that suits your creative vision. Anyway, I want to say thank you very much to Isotope. That's Ozone 7. It's well worth checking out because uh, it, it, it just adds, it can add so much to the mix, as you saw with that trail. Uh, we would like to point out that uh, you could be the winner of the competition. Uh, I've been announced the winner in a short while, but this is the competition for this week. Uh, we're asking you to tweet. Uh, it's a tweet-based, Twitter-based competition. So what you need to do is tweet the hashtag analog vibe. That's analog, just with a G, not with a G a G U E. All one word and the hashtag Ozone7, that's Ozone and 7, to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. That's the hashtag Analog Vibe and the hashtag Ozone7 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. To uh, enter the competition where we will win. Uh, if you enter, we can pick it from next week and uh, you may well be the winner. Which brings us to the winner of this week. This week's winner, uh, last week's winner rather I should say, because we're ahead by a week, is a chap called Dallas Kraus. His Twitter handle is dkraus087. So dkraus087, if you let make yourself known to us, uh, we will instruct the Isotope people to deposit Ozone 7 on your account and you'll be uh, the happy winner of one. He said, uh, uh, he tweet, as well as tweeting the, uh, the entry, he said, I'd really like to get my hands on Ozone 7 and so your wish has come true. So well, congratulations. Once again, we thank Isotope for sponsoring the show. Uh, if you want to get hold of a uh, full demo isotope.com forward slash ozone and you can download it as well right uh let's see what's next then uh i think the next one is ah here we go this is a, a, an interesting use of modular now this was from super booth my name is robert uh, this is a guy called robert ike aubrey low i'm an artist that i've seen him around on um uh the uh, make noise so booth where he's he's sort of, sort of, sort of I, I guess he's been helping out seen him at nam and i didn't realize he was an artist uh, and uh, he recorded this at super booth which is of course where we were in berlin and, uh, and what he does is he creates this these really kind of yeah. complex soundscapes let me f pass it forward big modular patch but he also uses his voice and i think he's using phonogene which is a, a sample and he rather than you know singing singing he creates these textures and they really are it's quite dark and moody but there's some beautiful stuff in here 
ominous, I think, would be a word I would use. Here we go. I think there's some... I think if we listen to it in the abstract, it probably is slightly less meaning than if you listen to the whole piece of all, because it does evolve really beautifully. And uh, this was part of something, because we had a visit from Andreas Schneider, who's the guy who organised Super. He came on Monday... Uh, I want to say hi to Andreas if he's actually watching. I guess he's far too busy. And yes, I did have a hangover the next day, but it was well worth it. So, and he was talking about, because all throughout the days at Berlin, there were these little um, slots. Everybody had a slot. It was for manufacturers, but his was stipulating very heavily that you could not just talk about the technology. It had to be a musical performance, which I think was a really, really good idea. And in this case, you know, it meant we discovered something uh, a little more interesting. Uh, I've looked around. There's not a lot on the web about uh, Robert's work, but uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy this. I'm Ty, I'm going to come to you first, because, I mean, you, you know, you create sort of mm-hmm. large soundscapes and that sort of thing did, did you kind of how did you feel about this did you get I, you might not have had a chance I, to listen to it did you because you already said no it. i had but i no i watched it before i knew about um about it being on today so uh i think if ever there's an advert for what to do with a modular or how to use a modular in a in a creative way this this is it i think you know it's fantastic this is how you should be used in my opinion this is how you should be using a modular because um those kind of soundscapey kind of textures you know you can do it all with multiple synths and with lots of software and whatever but actually having hands-on control and being able to um adjust it all in real time like that is is uh, it's just perfect advert for modular because you know we we all know how many times do we hear modular being just, you know, one sequence running and, um, you know, some filter sweeps and some, you know, Reaver. trying to make a, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and lots of, but we've, we've heard it all so many times. We've heard it so many times. And a lot of the time, you know, people that use modulars get accused of it not being musical or it not being interesting or, you know, it happened, you know, we've all heard it when it hasn't been used that well or that productively but i mean this is just a great advert this, this is great use of a of a eurorack system yeah, yeah very he, impressive he did very he did impressive. some really good stuff using the voice into the in, in, i guess into the phonogene sampler to, to create the transitions between sort of i guess movements and, and areas of sound rich did you mm-hmm. get a chance to check this out i mean it, again it's it, it, i did yeah it's a, a different kind of uh set of parameters perhaps than what we normally see from modular stuff i suppose as well, um, it, to echo Ty's sentiments, I quite liked the evolving nature and his ability to get, to get interesting results in real time on a very complex system. And I understand that certain parts of it have to be prepared in advance so that you can introduce them at a certain time. I look forward to a time when it goes a step further and you have discernible sections that uh, that come up based on the appearance and the disappearance of those things and a, a bit more of a, rather than just one long steady evolution that, to have the thing have an actual form would be interesting to me. And But I will say, I really thought his work was very good, very interesting. The sounds were cool. He was really engaged in it and I really enjoyed that. Um, I didn't necessarily enjoy the spoken preparation as much as I enjoyed the performance itself, as particularly where he mentioned uh, modular synthesis. Is re- he referred to it as an, an organic process of making music, and that I find a little hard to swallow, that something that you have to plug into a wall in order to get it to vibrate is, by its definition, in any way organic. Yeah, um, right. But besides that one little quibble... I quite enjoyed him and his work, and yeah. uh, and uh, think I would I would go see him. I I quite enjoyed it. It's interesting. He had a real intensity and very understated. So you were sort of I was kind of hanging off his every word because it was like because he was quite ponderous, but not too much to make it uncomfortable. It really kind of made you want to kind of okay, what's he going to say next? I'm really interested in what he's going to say, Mark. Soundscapes. I'm guessing this is this this, this is something. I like soundscapes. Yep. Yeah. You should get you should get some Rich modular well. stuff in your shop. <laughs> well, have it running yeah. all the time. I, yeah, I mean, I like the those. I can't remember what the name of the company is. They've got like those little pictures of space rockets all over the front of their Eurorack stuff. What's that stuff called? Oh, Do you know the one I mean? Sputnik. It looks 
<coughs> it looks it's like instead of being an aluminium brushed panel it's got like a brown or a beige colored panel that looks like a circuit board from the 1970s from inside my mum's old tv and then it's got pictures of little <laughs> rocket ships and little cartoon characters and things instead of instead of like saying saw sign and all that it's just got these bizarre pictures all over it but i can't remember it off the top of my head um and i agree with rich it's not definitely not organic and part of my usp for my shop is that i'm telling people that it's not organic like all the other shops in glastonbury which are, are <laughs> crystal <laughs> sound balls and ha- what are those things called hand pans and all those sorts of yeah. things which i i would consider to be closer to organic it should probably have a dead animal on it if it's going to be organic though shouldn't it <laughs> probably a organically fed dead animal um but i digress i um and I was st- oh, okay. I'm going off on another tangent. I was talking to somebody about modular synthesis the other day, and he was saying that this guy from a, a local band from Froome, I think, and I can't remember who, maybe Eat Static, I think, could be uh, that the guy, possibly that guy, is going to the synthesis in that band is going to do all of his future shows with a modular rig. And I was like, going, well, how the hell is he going to change from patch to patch? He's going to have to have someone come on and repatch the whole system for him. No, you just him. have a really massive mm-hmm. modular. Yeah. Well, that's what we were we were contemplating how you could do it, and we decided you'd have to have an A and a B rig in the same in the same system, and then you'd have to repatch half of it while you were moving to the other part. Part. So, if you wanted to do things in sections, you'd have to prepare the next section. And it would be so cool if one person was doing it. Actually, if they, as they were playing one section, they'd got enough mental agility to prepare the next section and then to make the transition into something that sounded completely different well um, but it takes a huge amount of skill to know where it's going to go when you plug things in because well to be honest though i mean it's very similar i mean i think what what tends to happen this this is this is as i understand it what you tend to do is you create little sub patches within the main patch which will then go into a mixer, which are then you can transition between them. So essentially, you know, what right. te- this is how I mean, this is not how everybody works. But like, for instance, I know that perhaps uh, Richard Devine works in this way to a degree. He'll create a patch which has a number of elements which are rhythmically linked, which you would then move between the the kind of the whole. Se- the section might be, you know, there might be a 16th part, there might be an 8th part, there might be a dotted part, there might be a different key or whatever, and you transition between them. And the tra- traditions are generally either cross-faded or you- you're using some kind of DSP effect or some other uh, sound uh, masking to be able to move between them. And that's that's why you have these larger systems where you have multiple clock divisions, you have multiple sequences. I mean, uh, Colin Benders is the same thing, and he's got a huge system. He does a, uh, a live modular thing every week. Or every, well, I think he might have been doing it every day as well worth checking out and he's now just doing everything modular and he's he's used to being you know a band leader plays trumpet has a big orchestra you know jules holland sort of style big band thing that's his bag and now he's doing stuff and that's the way you would tend to do it or that's the way one uh, one way of doing it where you you have a large enough system so that you can transition between sections of the modular that you're using at any one time it's a similar concept to the a b and c rig but you're patches are areas and then there are certain parts which might you might transition through which can then influence any one of those other sections and the, the construction of that patch yes is skilled and does take the time and, and i think um robert said yeah. in this that he just made this patch kind of just before the show he didn't really have it kind of totally worked out and you know that the skill then becomes in knowing what to do so that you don't go oops sorry about that you know you See, where I get stuck with it is because the machine's doing so much of the work. I mean, Nick and I used to, like, sit on Warren's living room floor with, like, the AKS, and we'd just plug things in. And we'd create these massive, long, evolving pieces that would last sort of like an hour, and they would do something not dissimilar to this, I suppose, with lots of swirly things. And both of us would just be hands-on plugging things and playing around with all this sound. But at the end of it, because it seemed so... It seemed ridiculously easy to me to do that i discounted any value in that being something that people might want to listen to afterwards it just seemed like a massive kind of um self-indulgent you know like yeah like a guitar so you know i'm not going to say the word but yeah i know what you mean yeah i mean it's like completely you know unnecessary like fiddling around with synthesizers and for me it was for the fun of it and I, i i can't imagine anyone else out there in the world 
wanting to listen to someone else well uh, that's where you're wrong i think there is a, there is the a, there is an appetite for this and it depends on the transition and the way that you do it. i mean another way that people do this and it's the same with many synthesizers you create all of these modulations i mean you probably find this tie you know you create a number of routings and modulations which you mm -hmm. then bring in the intensity of to affect you know so you might have yeah. one square wave doing one thing that doesn't come in for, for a couple of minutes and then that starts to affect the basic tie. you know you so you're you're mixing and a, control and, and modulations right on a completely basic level, when I'm working with, with my 55, you know, the fact is it's got seven oscillators. I mean, realistically, you don't use seven yeah, oscillators in one patch. Your output yeah. is a lot more melodic than this. So your output is something that I could, I could well, like, kind of sit back and on my sofa and make myself comfortable yeah. and listen to your music and read a book and really enjoy listening to your music and reading and just being a... In a yeah. in a kind of a world, whereas with this, I I I'd be really I don't know I I want to hear some kind of it doesn't feel like it moves me emotionally in any way. It's just like a sea of noise, and and I the, the, when I listen to music, I want to feel like I've gone through different transitions and emotional like, yeah, transitions. Like the, some the, of the, stru things, the structure you know. side of thing. Yes, I understand what you're yeah. saying. There. You're, you're right. I mean, it's. I suppose it's just what people get out of it. I mean, you know, I was when I was studying. I was. I think I've said this before. I was studying really, very, very avant-garde music, and a lot of it. You know, I spent really? my entire life trying to convince all of my friends that what I was listening to was actually music in inverted commas because they just thought it was just noise or random generated. See, that totally yeah. surprises me because when we did the but, um, the Sonic State Live thing, I sat there and I listened to you, and I actually welled up with tears at oh. one point because of the oh, that's like this whole emotional kind of thing. We were going through. We went on this, or I felt I went on a journey with you through this whole musical thing, and the fact that you just did it, that just turned everything on and went, "We're going to do this." <laughs> I was just like, wow, but, I don't know. I just, I, uh, and I'm no, not getting well, thank that you this, I mean, I'm afraid. So. No, I mean, I appreciate oh, that. Yeah. That's, that's really touching. Thank you for that. But, I th but, but I st I, what I should point out is I studied all of that. You know, so that doesn't mean, and I, I've, got, I've got lots of CDs of that kind of music. But what, what I've always found is um, I study it, I learn. I, I mean, I keep going, I seem to come on this show every single week and sit here talking about we need to be learning. But you, you, you learn by listening to things that you wouldn't normally listen to. Because, I mean, when I went, when I went to university to study composition, I was really into Debussy and Rachmaninoff and very kind of right. Richard Strauss, very big romantic stuff. That's my bag. That's how I wrote. And I went there and I deliberately went there and I chose where I went because they specialised in contemporary avant-garde stuff. And they absolutely poo-pooed Rachmaninoff and Debussy. And it, you, you couldn't write like that. So what I wow. always try to do is go, OK, so this is the way I write. And what I'm doing is I'm learning, I'm learning information about other types of composition. And now I take elements of that and I take aspects of that and apply it to what, you know, what was becoming my voice and my sound. And the good part about that is now, at this moment in time, the kind of stuff that I did when we did the live improvisation thing, that was very melodic and it was very, you know, kind of, it was nice. What you don't realise is a couple of months ago, I wrote a, a serious piece for electronics and trombone, which is very avant-garde and, and, and it doesn't really have, you know, it's not that melodic and has a lot of noise and soundscapes and this kind of thing. But it's it's yeah. the ability to kind of have the it's that have the knowledge and the head to be able to switch between them. So although I love I love a lot of this kind of um, contemporary kind of noise, what you call noise, kind of modular stuff. I think what mm. the, the thing that you've both said is perfectly true. The, the the stuff that doesn't work is the stuff that essentially doesn't really have any structure. And Rich is right. The easiest way of it doing it is to is it needs. I've I've made a big thing about saying for me, music has to go from A to B. It's yeah. music that just starts and finishes with a few crescendos here and there. That's not going anywhere. Music for me has to have a, has to start and it has to have an have an end. You know, it has to go somewhere. And it, that getting that somewhere could take twenty seconds. It could take two hours. I don't really care as long as there's direction in the music. And 
Um, that's the problem I have with a lot of modular stuff is that it kind of begins, it gets to the end, and you don't really know where it's gone or where it's been or whatever. You the can't I, you stuff, can't say I like that bit in the middle where it absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely, harder. and and so you're right. The difficulty is to actually, from a com- compositional structural point of view, to actually give it direction whilst keeping the spontaneity and keeping the kind of um, Keep the interest more than anything else. I think it's keeping the interest. It's very easy to keep interest using harmony and melody and rhythm. It's less easy got, to keep I've interest a, based if it's on just, what you've just said, noise related. Based on what no, you've just on. said, I've got a hot tip for the week. Okay. And this is, go and see a band you don't like. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Gina exactly. made me go to see Fish in Salisbury last weekend. Yeah. And I've never liked Fish particularly. I really enjoyed his concert. I thought he was brilliant, actually. He's a brilliant performer, and he doesn't sing out of tune, which was was a revelation. I think Kimsey must have just cocked the mix up or something along the way. Sorry, Chris, but I think he did. Oh, um, somebody's just won something on eBay. Um, can, oh. I just, can I just break? I just wanted to. I but, just. Um, want, I no, just. But I saw. So I watched this. I don't like prog rock, and I watched the guitarist go round and round this chord sequence. La, 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 la. And I was thinking, oh, God, this is doing my head in. About two nights ago, I picked up the guitar and I came up with this really cool chord sequence. And then I went, <laughs> oh, my God, this is Marillion. And I was like, oh, no, but actually, wait, if I just do that. Yeah. So I- I've subconsciously picked something up and then I've added it to something that I already do. And I've got like a new... A whole new I, thing. I, if happened. I could just bring it back, because that's what Robert's talk was about, essentially. At the end, he said, you know, what I do is I've, I've studied 12-tone scale. I stu- and the point is, go and do that, because then you can incorporate these things into your compositions and you will grow. And that was the, basically the, the same message as what we've kind of yeah. come to there. I don't yeah. know whether that uh, that resonates. Did you did you see that end part of it, Rich, where he kind of said, look, you need to go and find out about this stuff, because it will actually, you know, enhance your compositions and what have you. And he was right. But there we go. Didn't make it to the end. I was within 90 seconds. Well, first of all, I had to skip through the, the spoken introduction because it was just. And then I ended up skipping through the music because the stuff evolves so unbelievably slowly that I'm really just trying to figure out where he's getting to yeah. at that point. And uh, so, no, I missed the ending. But yeah, no, I can, I can recommend I kind of decided along the way that I, I figured out where he was coming from and what I liked about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, you could check. It's worth going to, actually, Superbooth Live. I think it's the Superbooth official channel on YouTube. I'll stick the link in the show notes. There's absolutely tons and tons and tons of them. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good, some of it's interesting, but there is a lot of performance stuff, so well worth checking out if you uh, if you have a few hours, days, actually, pretty much spare <laughs> to skip through it all. Okay, right, let's get on to... Uh, now for something completely different. Now, this really did kind of... Uh, blow my mind a little bit if i i I don't know what this is going to do for our copyright strikes probably nothing good but this is a um, this is basically an infographic if i turn it down it skips through it starts in the 1950s and you can pick the years it's not got all the years 70s and it charts all of the tracks that have been in the top five in terms of duration, so it, it, they move up and down and they fade in and out for how long they were at, at, at the number one spot. And it's it's actually, it sounds like torture, but it's a really interesting analytical tool in many ways. Because if you go back to kind of, you know, 1950s, let's say 1958, we haven't got a lot of stuff. Let's see what we've got there. Okay, as you can imagine, it's, you know, very much of its time. But what, what gets... Well, I'll leave it there, but you want to check this out. It's called polygraph.cool, polygraph.cool history. And I thoroughly recommend you check it out. Did anyone get a chance to look at this before I embarrass them by saying, did you see it? And then you didn't. Did, did Raise your hand if you did, and then I'll come to you first. Rich, I'll come to you first. I mean, I'm guessing, you know, you will have been conscious of a lot of, the, like me, a lot of this music over your lifetime as well. I mean... Uh, and so some of it has a, a familiar emotional resonance. So it does a number of things. And what is, it's an interesting stroll through history. But did you? Ta- did, was there anything you took away from the transition between you know then and now? Is there anything? Because I think the whole thing was premised as you know this is to prove that it, it, music wasn't any better in the old days, kind of thing. Well, I for some reason when it came up for me, it started with the '90s, which yeah. is not my favorite period of music to begin with. Um, 
And I, I, you know, the the larger lessons learned from examining what was in the top five at any given moment in time is a little bit like judging the entire culinary world based on the quality of the burgers at Wendy's. Yeah. Well, um, I- so it's not that relevant to me because I've never been a guy, I've always been interested in top five, top 10 music and what's happening there and why it works and everything else. But it's never been my primary focus of interest in terms of the kind of music I was pursuing throughout my life that interested me. So it it held some interest to me, and it's probably sociologically very uh, informative to look at what we do or don't like about the things that were big hits and what in different cultural times were uh, able to to achieve that degree of popularity and we can have long cultural discussions about why, but, but, uh, again, it is a certain part of me that really likes the fact that it's a really cool graphic and it's like kind of fun to watch and see the songs coming in and out of the picture and everything. But, um, ultimately the most interesting things I think that happen in culture are not always the ones that are the most popular. Yeah. Well, That's I would agree I with that. The, the, this is the, this is the, the sort of pop, element of it but yes it's the sort of thing well there was other music around that was really interesting that has more relevance but wasn't as commercially successful i totally agree with that and mark did you get a chance to check it out because it's it, uh, i was constantly trying to see patterns and trying to analyze it think well that means this that means that and did you find any of those light bulbs went off for you the only light bulb that went off for me was about halfway through um i realized it wasn't the british chart it must be the american chart. i think yeah i think so and then i was like thinking hang on a minute some of these years because i went i went like where am i going to go i'm going to go on a journey back into my childhood i remember that year what was oh and then it's like hang on a minute this isn't quite what you know it's not how i remember being 10 years old or 11 years old um and then the sort of realization that it was an american chart and then i'm uh so I'd like to see a British chart one, please. <laughs> yeah. I so would. I can go back and reminisce through some of those years. Well, there's Obviously, the, there's I wasn't that aspect. alive in 1958, but um, I was born in 1963. So, you know, Cliff Richard's Summer Holiday, I think, was number one when I was born. And that's not in this because I guess it wasn't a hit in America. No. Um, I mean, there's a, th- there is that division. I agree. I mean, I think um, one, well, I'll come to you, Ty, first, and I've got a couple of observations that, that, that uh, struck me. Well, I haven't had a chance to watch it, but I mean, even just the, the, you know, kind of premise of going through in the top five hits from every week, going back, back to the 50s. Um, exactly like Rich said, I mean, you know, kind of the, the charts really have never really well, there was a period when I was a teenager where they actually meant something. But apart from that, you know, exactly like Rich said, the 90s weren't the greatest decade for, for music. And yet a lot of my absolute favourite albums from the 90s, from artists that, you know, never had any success, but it was great music. So you had to find them. So this kind of idea of um, would be interesting from my point of view, and I'm sure lots of other people's point of view, just from a production point of view. Mm. And just going back and listening to the way mixes of um developed um i won't say improved but developed and and also the use of technology i mean you know i remember i remember a day when you could actually you could name you could tell what year uh, a record was even if you never heard it just by the drum sound you know we've all been there yeah. you know you could normally get it within a, a year either side you could get what just by the drum sound and i'm sh- absolutely sure you could kind of go back and and start doing it through the 70s and probably even the 60s. And and it's, you know, the way that recording techniques, uh, microphone techniques, introduction of electric guitars, you know, distortion, um, types of reverb, you know, the EQ on a snare drum, use of compressor, all of these things, they're the kind of things that, you know, do anyone good to actually go and listen to this, to kind of see... Not even from a songwriting point of view, because I think songs are songs are songs. And apart from exceptions, some more you know modern exceptions, I think you could take a lot of songs that are written today, and if you recorded them in a 1950s style, they wouldn't sound that that out of place. And the same way you could take a lot of songs from the 60s, and if you recorded them wow, and today, people do regularly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think I think a song is a song. Obviously, yeah. there are a lot of exceptions with a lot of modern stuff where it's they're not songs. Let's be honest about this; they're either just riffs or loops of some sort. 
don't stop me on that one. Um, but apart from that, you know, a song, a song is a song, and um, I think I think it's interesting. I think I think it's good for people to actually do. I mean, I speak to God. How old do I feel? I speak to younger people, uh, <laughs> and I speak to them. I speak to them about the eighties and the nineties, and then it's only when I really get to the look at their blank faces and suddenly realise that oh, you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about because you weren't even born, were you? You know, and it's yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of sad, really, because I, I, I actually think, but hang on a second. When I was around, I used to know what happened in my mum and dad's era. You know, I knew what happened in the 60s and 70s. Not not a huge amount, but, you know, I was brought up on Buddy Holly and Billy Fury and, you know, yeah. big stars in the 60s. But, yeah, there does seem a kind of a younger generation thing now. I think it's probably... So I was going to say, I think it's because they have access to so much music now. Yeah, well, there's more they, history to remember. I suppose Absolutely. that's the other thing. I, 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 there's so a couple... London's London's teeming with '80s clubs at the moment, isn't it? Or it was. I don't know if yeah. it still yeah. is. But so I mean, that young that generation are being are being filled up with the '80s, and the '80s were cool. And actually, the reason we had Billy Fury and and the, uh, Billy Buddy Holly had that one, yeah, all those kind of <laughs> things, is because they were that was the second wave of the, that kind of music, and it was all sort of being reformatted and set and, and uh, uh, marketed back to us, like with bands like Shawaddy Waddy and, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, can, uh, can I, can I just, so, I mean, can I just come so in? Cause they, aren't they the, doing a similar thing? They don't is, jump back that far. We didn't listen to music from the twenties, did we? So no, and, sorry, we, Nick, I'm talking all over you and I'll stop. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Rich <laughs> puts his hand up. He says, I, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to say about this. Um, the first thing was uh, it would be really co- what I wanted to know was who produced the, the record and who mixed it. If they could add that information in as well, that would be super interesting to me as a kind of you know somebody who's interested in that sort of thing. That would be really cool just to add that extra bit of data in there. The other thing that I noticed is uh, as you come through the years, uh, you can hear the uh, introduction of digital technology and sort of Pro Tools and what have you sort of through the nineties, uh, late well nineties basically, and in the nineties a lot of the mixes they had this very smooth quality there was a sort of sheen to them and they were more evenly balanced we get into the 2000s and suddenly everything is very is much more extreme like the the vocals often have a similar uh, have a similar level in the mix but the drums come up enormously the complexity of this is generalization the complexity of much of the sort of big hits drops away so you're banging it down to very loud drums very prominent vocals, a few other lighter instrumentation. And it, and I was thinking, I thought, well, I wonder when iTunes came along. And, it, you know, it's uh, 2000, 2000, 2001. Yeah. And then yeah. that's when you're getting into the MP3 generation. And you can hear it. Actually, it's, it, you can hear it here because some of these tracks are obviously turned into MP3s to be played back during this thing. And they sound absolutely dreadful. They're all sort of grungy and mungy and all of those things. So I'm thinking there's been this conscious change in the way that some records are mixed, particularly for low bandwidth stuff. Let's just qualify that. Yeah. To to make sure the algorithm doesn't get too confused with the music you're feeding in it. So it still sounds clean. It still sounds front and centre. And that's something that I was really like, okay, well, that there are these kind of points of correlation which you can pick up and i was i did have to look for this and i was trying to find these things but that's the thing for me yeah i agree about it's a song it's a song it's a song and later on there are more maybe not novelties but very strong sonic signatures seem to be the things that stay at the charts or you know maybe a slightly risque vocal or you know something unusual but it's the, the the nature and the soundscape of mixes seems to change quite dramatically during that period. Sorry, Rich, I, I, I muted you. I don't know if you were, you looked like you were moving your lips. It's because your typing was vigorous. Um, no, no. That's, that's the thing that I got from it. The, the sonic landscape changed, and it was very, very different to the sound of the 90s stuff to the sound of the 2000s and 2010s in terms of just the, the way the mix was more evenly balanced, shall we say, in those previous times, which was, that, that to me was interesting. Don't you think, do you think some of that is transition from people mixing on analogue, like um, SSLs and Neves, and then trying to do everything in the box? Because could be. I, can't get, could be. I can't get anything I, to sound anywhere near as good in the box as I could if I had a big desk in front of me. Could be, could and be. there's something about the I, way that 
the compressor channels work on SSLs or even on Neves that yeah. uh, allows well, you to create a much bigger kind of canopy of separation maybe, that maybe. you can't do Rich. in a computer. Yeah, Rich. Well, I tend to chalk it up more to the proliferation of mix bus crusher compressed limiters and people's abuse of those and how it became <laughs> more vogue to abuse those. And I, and I don't know that it has much to do with which console you're mixing on or whether you're mixing in or out of the box as what you use when you go ahead and do that. So when we were mixing on analog consoles, there weren't that many ways to crush the two bucks, bus that would do what these people do, and it wasn't that fashionable to do that. So it's a combination of things, but I'm not sure it's the analog console itself. I think it's the process we engage when we're using certain things. Okay. It's also the fact that, I was going to say, for me, a lot of it is the fact that, again, you know, kind of, I always say that it's always, I always sound such an idiot saying this, but li the limitations of gear always means that, you know, kind of, um, it always has, it has an effect on the sound. And even if you're working on a huge desk, there was always a limitation on number of compressors, number of reverb. You know, you know, when I was working on big desks, you would have, what, three reverb units, four reverb units, absolute max. And so there was always something to hold the whole thing together. There's always a glue. And um, these days, because you can have anything, you know, we do. And I'm as guilty of that as anyone. So a lot of the time it is... A lot of it is the limitations that... Well, it is, but the, but then if you listen to a lot of the way that these things sound, there are, there are the key elements are much more emphasised, generally speaking, and that might include mm -hmm. its own reverb or space, but they don't tend to overlap as much. You know, it, certainly the mixes in the 90s, this is just, you know, on, on watching this and listening to this, which I thoroughly recommend you do, to, to spend a bit of time if you've not heard it before, any of, any of our viewers... You can make your own conclusions, but it felt like there was a more evenness to everything. And because things didn't have to poke out, and now because I, it could be to do with the MP3 thing, it could be to do the fact there's prol proliferation of more music, so you have to really grab people's attention much more quickly and go, oh, what's that sound? Gosh, that's loud. That, that sticks out. That, that you then, it catches your attention and you might get onto the hook, which you might then whistle and then you might go and buy the download. And, you know, it's about, you only got a limited amount of time to get somebody's attention and, and therefore, you know, the exposure also. So I don't know. I mean, I, I agree that there's, everybody can put more some of my, I mean, some of my favourite, mu more recent favourite music is exactly as you say. So my, one of my favourite tracks is that Oliver Heldens track that he did with a woman called Becky Hill. And she was in the UK voice. And all that track is, is a kick drum and this one synth that goes dum, 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 dum. And it does the same riff for the whole thing, but it changes sound and evolves throughout the thing. And the whole thing, so hooky and catchy, it's like the hook, a beat, and a singer. And there's nothing else to that track. It doesn't really go anywhere else or do anything else. I wonder. But something about it sonically makes my ears go, oh, I just want to keep hearing that because it sounds so good. That's funny. Because um, uh, the first thing that I noticed in this chart, there, I think it was about 2000 something or other, and it was when uh, Will I Am's production started to show up in the charts. And they are very, right. very. Uh, of that nature they just go here's the thing that you want to listen to here's something that's kind of really too loud and too brash but it really makes you it hits you over the head and he seems to be yeah. very skilled at that kind of thing i think we've lost ty's video there but uh, i don't know I, I, it's it, it's something that's really interesting to watch and you know can extrapolate whatever you like most of what i'm saying may be completely untrue or inappropriate but it just those are the things that i took from it <laughs> It's not inappropriate, Nick, and I don't even think it's untrue. <laughs> okay, I think we seem to have lost lost. Uh, we seem to have lost Ty, and there's lots of rustling and kind of f fidgeting going on. So I'm guessing you might be trying to plug. His can you can you hear me? Can I can you, hear you, can you, Ty. Hear? Yes, we can hear you. Just can't see you, but that's that's okay. I, I saw it. I'll just adjust my um, settings. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Gosh, is it ten past five already? I can't believe it. There were uh, there were some other topics, but I think that that one honestly. I mean, I know I've been going on about it for a long time, but it, it's worth sitting and spending half an hour or so and just seeing if you can f find anything in there because I'm sure for everybody will find different things if you listen to it long enough and check it out. There's a, and, and and also go. Oh God, I remember that. What happened to them? And it can send you off on a bit of a tangent. 
And of course, you always spend quite a lot of time seeing if any of yours are there and trying to remember when they were released. That's what it did for me anyway, and that, that sadly wasn't anything, so that, that made me feel a little less less important and uh, <laughs> happy about myself. <laughs> Rich, I'm sure it's full of your hits, though. I'm, I'm sure there must be a ton of them in there. And um, and that's the thing that, uh, that, that... There's also that that sort of mining aspect. I guess it's kind of like ego mining or something like that. I don't know. It never, it never funny, occurred it never, to me it, to do that. Did right, I not? Exactly. It never occurred to me to go back and look for <laughs> things. I'm going to do might... it now. <laughs> <laughs> it literally never occurred to me. But the other... I, I, this, well, it start, this started me off on a little bit of a... a, a, a um, just before we go, a, a little bit of a kind of... I wonder what's in the charts now. And I went to look at the Billboard charts. Uh, I think I've got a top album here right we've got 100 top albums right and i was looking in here and there's obviously lots of contemporary stuff but there are still michael jackson 91 off the wall still there there are still wow. some albums in here that are bad company live 1977 79 there are you know there, there are uh, there, there are in fact how many one there's dark side of the moon one, in there still. no one <laughs> two Prince has albums at number three, number four, number eight, number 22, number 24, number 29, number 42, number 43, number 78, and number 100. Bloody hell. Yep. And there are a few other ones in there. Madonna, um, Like a Virgin's what? in there. Get you know, out that, of it. <laughs> honestly, why there is are some, that in there? I know. That's why I was wondering. Has Madonna I, died? Metallica, Metallica. No. Uh, let's see. There's a few other ones. Uh, Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. I mean, that's a... That's a nineties really? album, isn't it? Yeah, it's what's that? That's something that I found really quite surprising, shall we say? Have they had some of these things being re-released? Do you think? And um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm guessing they might have done. I mean, I, I don't know to be honest. Digitally <laughs> revamped format or something. Uh, let yeah, me see of course. what else is there. Oh yeah. But yeah, but Every why five not? Five years. Yeah, well, that, why wouldn't you? <laughs> anyway, uh, you you can take that from what you will, but it's it, it's a. a it was an enjoyable journey and well worth just kind of looking around and, and, and having a poke around. And it's great fun. I want to say um, I spotted that on Create Digital Music. Peter Kern wrote an interesting article about it as well. And that's where it got me on that, started on that journey. So I uh, thank him for, for that uh, that tip there inadvertently. So um, we should probably uh, wrap things up. Uh, before we go, I just want to remind you that if you want to enter the Isotope competition, uh, you would go to uh, tweet the hashtag Analog Vibe and the hashtag Ozone 7 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. to win a copy of Ozone 7. Uh, we want to say thank you to all of our chatties, the fulsome chat room, I have to say, and also all of our chats people on uh, the YouTube live audience. Thank you very much for joining us too. Happy birthday to uh, John Nada, who said it's my birthday today and I'm enjoying uh, listening to you guys. So I'm glad we could enhance your day in some way, even though it must be already awesome. So that that makes me feel good. Anyway, Rich, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope we'll, we'll 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 probably see you a little bit more because you're not off for a few weeks. So uh, as ever, great to have your input. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's always great. And Mark Tinley, thank you for joining us too. And uh, I guess you've got to get. Uh, what are your opening hours at the shop then? Are you? Uh, well, I thought I'd make it like easy at first. I, I thought if I start with eleven till three every day. So I just ease myself into this whole because I'm into very the, much of the I tyranny like a pottering, of retail. <laughs> yeah, pottering around at home is my thing. So I'm re- a real potter around her and very not a people person, which some of you already know. So I thought I'll ease myself into it. I'll do eleven till three, but by about ten thirty every morning, I'm thinking, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I've got to go out and see people. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been <laughs> arriving about quarter to 12 and nervously hiding behind my counter. So if you're watching, watch it, sorry, washing, watching, if you're wa- <laughs> listening, are we, what are we doing? We're watching. No, you are watching, aren't you? Uh, if you're watching and you want to come and visit me in my shop in Glastonbury, uh, please do. And if I'm not there, you'll have to phone me because I might be hiding at home. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, but, uh, the, the important, um, the important and then three o'clock because my son <laughs> comes in from school. That's and, it. You know, so, well, the important thing uh, about retail is if you say what your hours are, you've got to stick to them. <coughs> if you're shut, when people show up, they just don't come back. Oh, man. Oh, I've blown that completely then. Maybe I should take the hours off the door and just put, if I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. What if somebody <laughs> makes a trip? You've just announced this to our international audience. What if they make a trip all the way from wherever it may be to come and visit you and you're not there? That'd be terrible. Well, unless I've gone on holiday, which is in August. <laughs> okay. Um, 
<laughs> I'm, You're I'm not in, far probably away. Probably in Glastonbury somewhere, trying to buy shelves to put things on, or um, <laughs> or, or oh, Mark, uh, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Anyway, thanks. From, or, thank you very much, Mark. I don't know. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure yeah. having you. And uh, Mr. Ty Unwin, who is now represented can by, I can hear you, Ty, but we haven't got any video. But uh, we've still got your voice, which is good enough for us. Ty Unwin, thank you very much for joining us this week as well. I hope whatever no it is that's no. happened, your end isn't too terminal. I have no idea is the answer. So um, I will get that sorted somehow. Brilliant. But thank you. Been that's great. all right. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, so, everybody. And once again, can uh, I just say one more thing? Okay. In the chat room, they're saying, "Is your shop online yet, Mark?" Actually, I'm not. I I am really trying to connect with people and uh, create community and have a bit of fun in the real world as opposed to being online. So it probably will never have a website, or if it does, it will be a very sparse one. It's definitely about like being there in the community and, okay. and rubbing shoulders with uh, uh, with scruffy musicians. Gotcha. <laughs> if you go on any longer, I'm going to have to charge you advertising. <laughs> okay how much is it by the way <laughs> well it's no good because it's online is it so that's not going to work out <laughs> oh yeah oh, oh. <laughs> anyway folks thank you so much for joining us it's been great uh, as ever and we'll see you next time uh, and don't forget subscribe <laughs> to the channel and uh, enter the competition do all those things we'll see you next time goodbye <laughs>